The topic for today is the Drude model of solids. And Drude model of solids is the very first approach in solid state physics, which tries to describe material behavior, material properties in terms of the very fundamental behavior of uh, the uh, core particles and here, namely the, elect the electrons. That atom is not the smallest particle out of which materials are consist uh, has been suggested already before Thompson. That was suggested in the second half or speculated in the second half of 19th century. But Thompson was the first one to provide a, a, a quantitative estimation what might be these smaller particles, the particles that actually form an atom. An atom is a particle which goes back to the, um, back to the Greek era. And so he was observing cathode rays. Uh, that means the rays that were generated from heated up a cathode. And he observed that the, whatever these rays were, that they propagated much further in the air, what would be, uh, to what would uh, correspond to particles of a size of an atom. And that brought him to an idea that the cathode rays must be formed of something smaller than an atom. He called these smaller particles corpuscles. And he also estimated from this uh, mean free path that those particles would be roughly a thousand times uh, lighter than hydrogen atom. So the smallest known atom. Later on, he also figured out that the corpuscles carry charge because he was able to direct the direction of propagation by external electric field. And so he proposed a new fundamental particles, fundamental in the sense that they were smaller than atoms, um, as, L as corpuscles, which are very light, which are negatively charged, and that they are universal. That means independent of the type of cathode that he used, he was always observing the same corpuscles forming the cathode rays. And this marks the discovery of an electron in 1897 by J.J. Thompson, who was awarded for this discovery Nobel Prize uh, for physics in 1906. J.J. Thompson was a director of so-called Cavendish Laboratory. I'm not sure whether you have heard about the Cavendish Lab. It's one of the most famous physics labs in the world. Uh, this is what we see here is an old Cavendish, so-called old Cavendish, uh, located in the center of Cambridge, UK, uh, where J.J. Thompson performed his experiment where he actually discovered the electron. Uh, somewhere on this side of the wall is this blue plaquette, which remembers this discovery of the electron exactly in this building. About 15 years ago, in the old Cavendish was still an active lab. By the time, very stylishly, it was an electron microscopy lab. These days, the uh, material science department together with the physics department are moved out of the center of Cambridge. And these buildings are uh, rebuilt into a science museum. Just out of uh, curiosity, um, here somewhere on the picture would be a famous pub in Cambridge called the Eagle. And this is the pub where Creek and Watson announced the discovery of DNA or that they decoded the molecule of DNA using the diffraction topic of our last week's lecture. And Creek's and Watson's lab was actually, if you would go through this pathway inside of the courtyard, there was a built-in new 
ugly building and that was where their X-ray diffraction lab was located. Only a couple of years later, a German physicist, Paul Drude, came up with a model how we can actually describe the behavior of electrons. And all what he has done is that he has taken the known theory, theories, uh, basically proposed by Boltzmann um, about the behavior of ideal gas particles. And he added to those gas particles to the description of ideal gas charges. So his model of material looks pretty much like what is shown schematically on this picture, where we have some atoms that act only as a scattering centers for otherwise freely moving electrons. The electrons are free between any collisions. The collisions are only together with the atomic cores. They are instantaneous. Just come here, right? They are instantaneous. That means that the time that the scattering process takes place is infinitely small. Uh, the probability of the collision, that a collision, that the scattering process happens within a time period uh, is given by one over tau, where tau is a fundamental material property. Uh, so differs from material to material, it's called relaxation time. And essentially tau uh, relates or is the average time between the collisions. So one over tau is the probability that a collision happens. One minus one over tau is the probability that an electron continues its path without collision. And another very important assumption of this uh, oversimplified through the model is that the state of an electron after the collision does not depend on the state before the collision. So basically there is no history of the motion of an electron. When an electron collides, it generates a completely new random state, state in the sense of a direction and also magnitude of the velocity to where it moves. There is no interaction between electrons. The electrons are free they, uh, they, and, and independent, so they do not collide with each other. And the only uh, role of the material of the atoms here is to provide these scattering centers, which are, however, treated in a uh, fuzzy way. They are treated in, the, uh, in this effective background charge or background potential that says what is the probability of the scattering right so actually the picture as we have here on the right bottom part where we see the discrete structure of uh, atoms where we see basically our crystalline structure this is already too detailed the electrons in the model they just see a homogeneously distributed background potential, background potential in the sense, once again, that provides the origin for the scattering. However, potential coming from the ionic cores, from the atoms, is not in any way explicitly accounted for. The only external contribution to the motion of electrons that will be considered here is the external electric field, this is indeed external to the sample that we use and later on also the magnetic field. So with those assumptions, let us now try to describe or derive what would be the DC conductivity. We really think about electrons as a flux of charged particles under an electric field. Once back. What we are going to count is the number of particles from this volume with the length dx 
that make it through the area A. The volume of these particles, A times dx, determines the number of particles which go through this area. The number of particles is given by the density of electrons n times the volume n times a times dx. We relate the distance dx to the average velocity, average drift velocity, that's the average velocity of uh, all the electrons of the ensemble of electrons uh, times the relaxation time d uh, times the relaxation time tau. So this is n times a. And now we have the average velocity times tau. This is the number of electrons. So what is the charge that they carry? Each electron carries a charge minus E. So if I multiply this charge by the number of electrons, I get the total charge that is transferred through the area A over time tau. So what I will do now, um, what I will do now is that instead of the relaxation time tau, I will now think about an average, or not, not the average time between the collisions, but a certain time period that is delta x corresponds to dt. That means we change it here to, which I can do here easily, right? To dt. And now we remind ourselves how is the current defined? The current flux is defined as the charge which goes through an area, a unit area, over time dt. So if we now put everything together, we get that this is minus E times, and for N, we go for the formula we have here, times N, A cancels out, uh, and then we have here the average velocity V. So this is now the current. What is reminding, uh, remain, uh, reminding now is to express what is this average velocity. Obviously this average velocity is going to depend on the applied electric field. If I do not have any electric field and all my particles go in completely random directions, especially after they undergo certain scattering events, then the average velocity as a vector is going to be zero. Why? There is the same amount of particles statistically going in one direction as well as in the opposite direction. And those on average would cancel out each other. The only situation where we get non-zero value for this mean velocity is when we bias them. That means we get more particles going on average from left to right than from right to left. And this is what we will do with external electric field. So we are now going to express what is the velocity, the mean, sorry, we start with the velocity of one particle. Now, there was a certain starting velocity V0 after the collision. And this is completely random variable, V0. Between the collisions, the electrons are free, free from interactions with the material. So there is no scattering happening. However, they are under the influence of externally applied electric field, which provides a force for acceleration. This force, is charge of an electron times the electric field. This is the force divided by mass of an electron. There we get the acceleration 
the charge of an electron is minus E, it's negative, and times T, where T is the time from the scattering event up to now. So let us now calculate what is the average velocity. That means we put the average symbols everywhere here. So our average velocity is going to be, once again, what is the average velocity after the scattering? This is a completely random process. So the probability that the velocity right after the scattering event is in a certain direction as well as in the opposite direction is equal. And therefore, averaging such an ensemble where I have equal number of states in one and the opposite direction will average to zero. Electron mass, uh, so electron charge, electron mass, as well as the electric field are constants. Charge of an electron, mass of an electron are fundamental physical constants. Charge, um, sorry, the intensity of an electric field is a constant because we speak here about the DC conductivity, direct current. So we have a constant electric field. It doesn't change with time. So the last thing that we need to average is the time t. Now, what is the mean time t that a particle would average, uh, would experience? That is the time between the uh, between the two scattering events. So we got a formula for the mean velocity and the properties which describe the material which are fundamental constants and which describe our situation, our externally applied electric field. When we now put all of this together, we end up with the final equation. So here we put this into here and we end up with the final equation for the relationship between the current density and the electric field. And this is nothing else than the uh, differential form of Ohm's law. That is the linear relationship between the applied electric field and the current density. In the integral form, you know this as the current equals the resistivity, uh, sorry, resistivity times the current equals the applied voltage. Right. Uh, the constant of proportionality here, this is the conductivity. So the, the reciprocal value of the conductivity is called the resistivity. And this is beautiful. Once again, we have now a macroscopic material property, conductivity or resistivity, whatever you prefer, which is related to fundamental physical properties. These are a few, one, among few constants which sort of describe our universe and two material related constants. Again, something extremely fundamental. Tau describing the mean time between collisions of electrons and N describing the density of the electrons. So how many electrons do I have available per unit volume? That's beautiful. This is what we want to do. We want to describe our macroscopic material behavior using the very microscopic processes of fundamental particles. We can even further relate this density of electrons and therefore the conductivity to more material properties, and namely if we realize that the density of electrons is really the number of electrons per volume, the number of electrons is essentially the number of atoms, NAT, times their valency. That means 
how many conducting electrons do we have available per volume. We can also express the volume using the mass density. So then we end up here with uh, M over rho, where rho is now not the resistivity, but this is the mass density. So I put here rho M. And by putting this now, or changing this into uh, the order, we get the rho M uh, to the denominator and here, uh, sorry, in the denominator and in the denominator, we can have m oval over m t. What is this? If you think about it, m is the mass of our sample, n a t is the number of atoms. So this is essentially the mass of a single atom. The last thing what we can do is now to relate this to another material property, so-called molar mass, M, which is a mass of one mole of atoms. So if I divide this by the number of atoms and in one mole, we have Avogadro number of atoms, we get exactly the mass of an atom. So then we can replace this with the mass, with the molar mass and the Avogadro number. And we end up with the uh, relation Z, number of conducting electrons per atom times rho M, which is the mass density of our material times Avogadro number divided by the mole, molar mass is equal to the density of electrons. That's the formula that we have here. Once more, maybe you want to put here the index M to signify that this is the mass density, not the resistivity as it was on the previous slide. You can try to calculate how many electrons you end up with for some materials. Here is an example of aluminium with three valence electrons. We know the valence configuration of, an, of aluminium as being 1s2. So it has two 1s electrons. Those are core electrons. They do not really participate in any bonding. Then we have two s2 electrons. Again, two electrons sitting in the 2s orbital. So they are more, uh, let's say, widely spread in the space. They have higher energies than the 1s electrons, but they are still relatively tightly bound to the, uh, to the whole material. And then we have two p electrons. We have six of those. So it's a closed shell. Uh, those would be the electrons that form oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, boron. And then we come to the really valence bands, to the uh, valence configuration. So we have three S electrons and namely two of those. And then we have these three P electrons and there is just one. So if you count the number of electrons, 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 1 is 13. We end up with the 13 electrons, the atomic number of, of aluminium. And out of all of those, just those three guys here are the really valence ones, the guys that can contribute towards the conductivity. So that's the Z equal to 3 that we have here. And then we would use look for some tabulated values for the mass density and for the molar weight of, uh, of aluminium. And this would allow us to estimate the number of conduction electrons, the density of the conduction electrons. 
So here we speak really about extremely high densities. You see that it's 10 to the power of 22 per cubic centimeter. It means in a cubic meter, we speak about uh, units in 10 to the power of 28. If we say that this is actually uh, in the order of between 10 and 100, then we speak around roughly for the conductors around 10 to the 29 to 10 to the 30 electrons per cubic meter. So this is the density of electrons that we experience in conductors. We can also play around with the relaxation time. Uh, the relaxation time can be expressed using uh, the mass of an electron, density of electrons, charge of an electron, and the raw here is not the mass density, but this is the resistivity. In fact, the formula that you have here is just a rewritten formula for conductivity from the Ohm's law, right? So it is not so that the relaxation time can be expressed using other material properties without paying a price for that. We need to know either the resistivity of the material or the relaxation time. The point of this expression is that while tau, the relaxation time, is something which is fundamentally describing the processes in the material to describe their behavior, our understanding of how the electrons should move. The raw resistivity of a material is a property that can be experimentally relatively easily measured. The strength of this relationship that we have here is that we have a direct relationship between those two, between the tau, between the relaxation time, the fundamental quantity, and rho, the measurable macroscopic property. In our material, we would assume that tau is temperature independent. However, we see it is not. The fact that it is not comes from the fact that the resistivity is not temperature independent. We know that for metals, the resistivity increases with temperature and therefore the time tau, the mean time between the collisions decreases with temperature. We see that the decrease in uh, with temperature is dramatic. It's an order of magnitude. When we go from low temperature or cryogenic temperatures, up to room temperature, this is actually the zero Kelvin temperature, uh, sorry, zero degree C temperature or 100 degree C temperature, right? The fact that tau is not constant, that it decreases with temperature only confirms our intuitive expectation and what we would expect from how the model works, how the uh, how the material should work. Why? Well, with increasing temperature, we expect that the atoms would stronger vibrate. That means they have an increased effective cross-section. An electron is at low temperature and it essentially passes through the still crystalline structure. It uh, sees the still atoms with a certain cross-section, but with a large space, with a large free space. And therefore, the probability that it hits an atom is relatively slow, small. The time between collisions is relatively high. If the atoms now start moving, the effective cross-section increases. So it's like a forest in the wind. And the probability that an electron flies without hitting any atom decreases. The average time between collisions decreases. So this is the explanation why intuitively 
we actually expect such a behavior, such a relationship between tau and temperature. We will not discuss this uh, in any more detail. One more thing that I want to make here is related to the averaging. We have said that the average V0 is zero. Here should be a, a vector. Without vector, it is actually not correct. So what is the difference? If we average V0, that means we go over all possible directions and all possible magnitudes of velocities right after the collision. From saying that the magnitude as well as the direction are completely random, we say that there is the same probability of atom going in one as well, sorry, electron going in one as well as in the opposite direction. And this argument leads to the fact that the average velocity after the scattering event as a vector is zero. When we look at the average square velocity, that means the average kinetic energy, once we multiply this average square velocity by one half times mass of an electron, this is obviously not going to be zero. The electrons are moving on average. And each electron, no matter in which direction it goes, it has a non-zero kinetic energy as soon as the magnitude of the velocity is non-zero. Again, independent of the direction. Kinetic energy is the same if it goes north as well as when it goes south. And from statistics, we know, and this is the part where the Maxwell-Boltzmann theory of ideal gas comes in the game, that the kinetic energy, average kinetic energy per atom, is given by 3 halves kBT. kB is the Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature. So only when we speak about exactly zero Kelvin, then all electrons are still. As soon as we are at higher temperatures, they are moving, there is a scattering, and the average kinetic energy is non-zero. When I said at the beginning that here should be the vector, indeed, this is true because V0, that means the mean magnitude of the velocity, is equal square root of V0 squared. And this is non-zero. This is given from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And this actually provides us, together with the relaxation time, with another important characteristic, lambda, which is the mean free path. This is the average distance that an electron travels between collisions. Obviously, it is related to the mean time between collisions and also to the mean velocity, magnitude of the velocity. The average mean free path is in the range between uh, angstroms and nanometers. If you remember what is the lattice constant of typical cubic materials, you end up somewhere between three, four, maybe five angstroms. Then you see that this is the range at which the average mean free path is defined. That means on average, it is every or every second or every third atomic plane that actually contributes to the scattering of an electron. Now we derive the equation of motion for an electron. So we will try to put together a statistical picture on 
the equations of motion. What do we do? We try to estimate the momentum of an electron and momentum, just as a reminder, is mass times velocity, right? So the average momentum at a time t plus dt. So we move from a certain time where we know the state and the state at that time is pt. We move to the time t plus dt. We move forward. Now, with a probability one minus dt over tau, no scattering happens. The electron simply moves in a straightforward manner and is probably only under the action of an external force, F. The external force times the time period gives the increase or decrease with time linear increase or decrease of the momentum. So if no scattering even happens, then the, pro, the momentum in time t plus dt is the momentum in time t plus the force times the time increment dt. Now, this scenario happens with a certain probability. That means with the reminding probability with dt over tau, a scattering event for this one electron happens. If it happened, the electron has a completely new velocity with a completely new magnitude, independent of what was the state before the collision. And so we adhere without loss of generosity, P0 at time T. If we now want to say that the collision doesn't happen at exactly time T, but halfway between t and t plus dt, then we can also express this by saying that the p0 at this mid time is actually just uh, decreased or increased uh, with using the appropriate force acting over this remaining time, right? So because of this reset of the history, the completely random state after the collision, we can assume here very easily that the time p0, uh, sorry, the momentum p0 is, uh, is a random variable. What is missing now is when we try to calculate the averages, we simply uh, put the averages over all of these quantities. Again, things which are independent of averaging, such as dt, uh, remain out. And then we calculate the averages here. So what is the average momentum uh, after the collision? The momentum, once again, is m times v0. And we already know that the average v0 after the collision is 0 in a vectorial form. Therefore, also the P0 momentum after the collision is going to be zero. What do we have left then is the mean momentum at time t plus dt minus, now I have to think about it, minus one times this average momentum pt here equals what is left on the other side minus dt over tau times average momentum p at time t plus and from here uh sorry and from right from here we get that we have the average force dt minus average force e to t over tau. Right, what do we do next? 
Well, we say that dt is infinitesimally small. That means we neglect this term with dt squared. This is an order of magnitude smaller contribution than the other terms, and we therefore say that this is negligibly small. We also denote this left-hand side of the equation as the change of the momentum, d p tau at t. And now we would say that we divide the whole formula by dt. This is mathematically imprecise. So let us now say that we really calculate the, uh, from the differentials, we come to the derivative. And finally, with these guys here coming to the left-hand side, we end up with the dp at time t over dt equals, and what do we have there? One over tau p at tau t plus the force f average force. This is what we will now call the equation of motion. It describes the time evolution of the momentum, average momentum of an electron based on the material properties, so the scattering events and the externally applied forces. Here we go with the equation of motion. So let's now try to apply this equation of motion to a well-known behavior, material behavior. And this is a DC Hall effect. Namely, what we do is that we describe a situation of a flux of electrons where we do not have only an electric field applied, and therefore we expect to get a certain flux of electrons in this direction. But in addition to that, we apply a perpendicular magnetic field. What happens now? Well, we apply simply the equation of motion with not having only the electric field there that would be leading us to the Ohm's law, but we have there the whole Lorentz force where we have also the interaction between a moving electron and the magnetic field. You know this, hopefully you remember this from the high school physics, that an electron moving in a certain direction in a magnetic field will start or will experience a force which is perpendicular to both of these vectors. So if I have a vector of velocity, I have a perpendicular uh, magnetic field, then I apply the right-hand rule and I get the, uh, the direction of the force of an electron. So this is written here in the vectorial form. The force acting on an electron perpendicular to its direction of motion is given by this vector product. I believe that all of you are familiar with the vector products. We can write it in the coordinates as we have it here. Our coordinate system is actually given by these axes. That's how we assume it. So the momentum vector is given by px, py, and zero. We do not expect any momentum in the direction perpendicular uh, along the magnetic field. So that this is how we, uh, for the time being, assume that the momentum vector looks like. And the magnetic field is in the z direction. Or we can even simply write it just here. Then P times B vectorial form is a vector. And now, how do you calculate it? The x component is when you calculate the cross py times b minus 0 times 0. 
y times b. The y component is zero times zero minus px times b. And the z component is finally px times zero minus py times zero, which comes to zero. So in vectorial form, the components of this vector product are given here. Now we put everything together and we actually are going to write the x and y components of this equation of motion. Let's do that. What do we get? We get that uh, dpx over dt equals minus e times ex minus the x component was there um, over m p y b minus p x over tau. All right, all right. For the y component, we get the p y. So this is the time change of the y component of the momentum is minus e e y minus one over m. M is the mass of an electron. P x b minus p y tau. Once again, this is nothing else than just the two non-zero components of the momentum uh, written out of the equation of motion. What we would like to describe is a steady state situation. In a steady state, the quantities do not depend on time anymore. And that means that any time derivatives are gonna be zero. So we have reached the equilibrium we do have the externally applied electric field. We do have the macroscopic flux of uh, charge. We do have non-zero Jx, but we do not have any time changes of this. So we put this equal to zero, both of those components. And we work out of here what we can get. So we also do expect that if we do such an experiment, the final components of the electric flux, J, will be only in the x direction. There will be no net flux in this direction nor in that direction, right? We have nicely simple linear uh, relationship between the electric field, the applied electric field, and the electric flux. We apply the Ohm's law saying that J Y, which we require to be zero, is minus N times E times the average velocity in the Y direction. The average velocity in the Y direction is related to the average y component of the momentum over m. And from here, from this relationship, from here and here, we get that py is equal to zero in the steady state. OK, so we can now place this back in the equation for the x component. For the x component, we had E ex uh, minus E over M P Y B minus one over tau E X equals zero. This zero comes from the fact that we have this steady state, right? Time derivative of the x component of the momentum is divided uh, is is uh, zero. Now we know that this part is zero as well. So what do we end up with? Is that p x equals minus e times tau 
times Ex. And this is nothing else after a little bit of juggling than the Ohm's law. So this is Ohm's law in the x direction. Right? So this is simple as it is. That's what we expect. But now, what about the y component? This is where it becomes interesting. For the y component, the equation of motion gave us d e y over d t was equal to zero, and this is minus e. And here we have e y, so the y component of an electric field, which is something that we would like to determine. Right? We do not yet know whether this is zero or not. Uh, how do I have it here? Right, uh, minus. There should be Px divided by Mv minus Py divided by tau. Now, this part we know is equal to zero, but here we have some non-zero quantities. Right? So we get that zero equals something where Px is related to Ex, the electric intensity in the x direction via the Ohm's law. And therefore, for non-zero magnetic field B, we get that there must be a non-zero perpendicular electric field EY. When you put all of this together, you essentially come to the expression. It is now here at the slides already. You would come to the expression that E Y, oh, is it on the next slide? Why? That the E Y is equal to the magnetic field divided by the charge density or the electron density and the electron uh, transfer. We can have a look at this. Uh, a little bit more in detail. So namely, what did we get on the previous slide was minus E times E Y equals, and then we had there E V over M. Uh, this is still from the Lorentz force. Uh, we have there also a minus sign because it had the opposite sign than the and the electric uh, force times E P X. From the Ohm's law, we now say that P X, that is the other component that we have derived, was minus E tau E X. So let's try to put it here. And we get that. Uh, Finally, minus E E Y equals E squared tau V over M E X. And so if we uh, would now express If we would now express how is the uh, electric field and all those quantities related to the charge density, we actually end up with the formula that we have here. Um, <laughs> I have to say, that I am not sure, no, this, this is not correct, right? If we, we need here to have the charge Kx as well. There is apparently a typo in the, in the lecture notes, all right? So if you would do that, if we even delete uh, or cancel out everything here, we cancel E here, we cancel this squared, we cancel this minus, put it in here. And then on the right-hand side, we still would have something related to the 
uh, magnitude of the electric field X, which is in here expressed by the uh, flux density of, uh, of the charge, right? the current density JX. So then we can finally try to relate the magnitude of this perpendicular electric field EY to the other quantities that generated it and namely to the magnetic field and to the, well, Jx, the x component of the uh, current flux, or to the perpendicular electric field. No matter how you do it, you would end up with the expression that this fraction, Ey divided by Jx and B, is constant, and the constant is minus one over Ne, where N is the density of electrons and P is a charge of an electron. So this so-called whole constant becomes a material constant, becomes something which in our way of description is temperature independent and is independent of the applied external electric magnetic field it simply says that whenever you have applied a direct electric field, a perpendicular magnetic field, then after you reach the steady state, there will be an electric field perpendicular to both our primary electric field and the magnetic field generated with an intensity that is related to both of my applied fields and dependent on the material constants this way. This is a great thing. We can use now our macroscopic Drude model, microscopic theory, to explain a macroscopically observed phenomenon, the DC Hall effect. It has some flaws. Eventually, it turns out that when you do the measurements of the Hall constant, it is not independent of the magnetic field as our formula above would suggest. Also, we suggest from here that the magnitude of the whole constant or whole coefficient is always negative, simply because the density of electrons, as the number of electrons per volume is a positive value, the charge of an electron is. Uh, we express it here as minus E, therefore E is a positive value and we get therefore that RH is always negative, all those quantities are positive. However, in experiment, the constant comes sometimes positive. And uh, this can be explained only by applying quantum mechanics and eventually explaining that for certain materials, we can describe instead of electron mobility, electron charge transfer, we express the charge transfer via an opposite motion of oppositely charged particles, so-called holes. And this would lead to positive values of hole coefficient. So, Despite the fact that the Drude model provides us very promising, very good uh, results, very fascinating, really microscopic insight, one has to be careful about overinterpreting those results. We are not yet at the end of the journey. We do not have yet the full description. Nevertheless, we see that describing an ensemble of electrons provides a very powerful tool for maybe predicting material properties from really the microscopic fundamental particles behavior. In the last part of this today's lecture, I will focus on thermal conductivity and bring us to the Franz Wiedemann law. What we do here is that we look or we try to estimate the thermal conductivity. Similarly to the 
electric conductivity, the thermal conductivity is related now not to the flux of charge, but to the flux of heat, to the flux of energy. And the driving force is not the difference of the potential, the gradient of the potential, but instead it is the gradient of the temperature. The Fourier law states that the flux of the heat is oppositely, uh, is, is uh, linearly proportional to the gradient of the temperature times a material property called heat capacity. What we try to do is that we say that the energy, the heat, which is being transferred, is solely related to the electrons that come from one part of the material to another part. And the energy that we consider here as the heat transfer is only related to the kinetic energy of those electrons. So what we will try to do is that we stand in the position X zero and we count electrons which come from one part, from the hotter part, and therefore bring more energy. They have higher kinetic energy. They bring more energy in the direction left to right. And then we subtract the amount of energy that is being transferred in the opposite direction by those colder electrons, electrons which come from right, which, have, which were generated, scattered uh, by atoms at temperature T2. And therefore, their average kinetic energy is lower. Once again, why do we relate the kinetic energy to the temperature at that given point? This comes back to the Trude model to the description of electrons as ideal gas, where from the thermodynamics, we relate the mean velocity, and the mean kinetic energy to the statistical ensemble, the three halves of kBT. So by doing these equations, we, as I said, count the electrons that come from left to right and bring energy that is related to the temperature T1. And then we subtract the amount of electrons that go from right to left and bring temperature or energy related to the temperature at that point. We can rewrite this heat flux in a differential way, simply by saying that what we had there is a number of, or the density of electrons uh, times their mean velocity in the x direction. The difference in the energies is uh, replaced here by the derivative of the energies with respect to temperature. Then we have the gradient of the temperature and T delta X. Where does this come from? Well, we essentially say, if we want to do this, that the energy at temperature at position X zero minus BXT minus energy at temperature at position VX plus T. Now we say that this is roughly the derivative of energy with respect to temperature times the delta of the temperature. So how does the temperature change when we go from X minus VX T to X plus Dxt. All right, but this change of the temperature we can also represent by knowing the gradient. How does the temperature change with the position? 
when we go from the x minus vxt to x plus vxt, which is then times x plus vxt minus x minus vxt, where these parts cancel out each other, which would be minus here, right? So we end up with this two times vxt, and then having in mind the one half that was uh, written in the macroscopically counting numbers of electrons on the previous slide, we would uh, we would essentially uh, cancel out also this factor of two that comes here. So we indeed end up with the expression that we have written here. And the last thing that what we can say is that now here we have the gradient of the temperature. It's written here. And the total energy with respect to temperature, we now write as the change of the internal energy, because we don't have any other contributions to the energy than just the internal energy from the electrons. So the energy uh, with temperature. What actually is the change of the temperature, uh, the internal energy with temperature? Well, this is heat capacity. That's exactly the definition of the heat capacity. Du over dt is the heat capacity. Now, when we divide it by volume, then we have the specific heat capacity. So this should have been capital and this is small c. So this is the heat capacity uh, representing the amount of energy that we have to put into the material per unit volume, per unit mass, uh, in order to increase the energy, uh, sorry, to increase the temperature by one degree C. And again, from the statistical thermodynamics, we know that this uh, specific heat capacity is equal three halves of NKB, where N is the density of the ideal gas, and in this case, our ideal gas, uh, guys, uh, ideal gas uh, represents electrons. And therefore, n is here the density of electrons in our ensemble, in our system, in our specimen. It means we have related this part of the uh, of this Fourier law to three halves and kb, where n is the density of electrons. What we need to do now is to realize also what is the vx squared, the mean velocity squared in the x direction. The electrons are moving in all directions with the same probability or are scattered in all directions with the same probability. Again, one of the assumptions of the model. That means that the mean squared velocity in x, y, and z directions are gonna be the same. And obviously, the mean squared velocity is equal vx squared plus v y squared plus v z squared. If we now say that because of this random process, all those components are identical, then all of those must be equal to one third of v squared. But we know what is this. We know that from the mean kinetic energy of ideal gas is also three halves of NKB T. Therefore, out of here, we finally get the relation that heat capacity, uh, sorry, the V squared is VX squared is equal to K E T over M E. And now plugging in this into here, 
go actually to this part and plugging this part for the VX here, we end up with the expression for the heat capacity, uh, for the heat conductivity of our material. Because what do we have on the left-hand side is the heat flux. On the right-hand side, we have the minus gradient of the temperature and everything what is left, therefore must be the heat conductivity. Heat conductivity kappa is now expressed using the fundamental physical quantities, state property, temperature of our material, and material properties, heat capacity, specific heat capacity, and the uh, relaxation time, which again describes how the electrons are scattered. All right. So we have managed to describe another material law, another material relationship. This time, the relationship between the heat flux, the energy transfer, and the gradient of the temperature using very, very fundamental material properties and physical constants. This brings us now finally to the Franz Wiedemann law or Wiedemann Franz law. Two German scientists, physicists who uh, performed experiments at constant temperature and postulated based on their experimental observations that the ratio between, he, uh, between thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity should be constant. Later on, Ludwig Lorenz made uh, further observations and generalized this observation to the fact that the heat, the heat conductivity divided by the electric conductivity and temperature should be constant. So he generalized this Franz Wiedemann law at constant temperature to a really relationship between heat capacity and electric, uh, sorry, not heat conductivity. The heat conductivity, electric conductivity, and the temperature of the material, that those should be constant. Uh, when we plug in our expressions for heat, Cap conductivity and for electric conductivity from the Ohm's law, we plug in those two relationships, what would we get? Let's try that. Uh, once again, kappa from the previous slide was minus KB, oh, sorry, there's no minus, KBT over ME. This was the average velocity in the x direction squared times tau, the relaxation time, times the heat capacity. And we express the heat capacity as 3 halves NKB. For the electric conductivity, we know from the Ohm's law that this would be M electron over N E squared I I have deleted too much. Uh, conductivity is N E squared tau divided by M E. All right. So let's now try to put this into the Lorentz Wiedemann Franz expression. What do we get? So we get KBT over ME times tau times three halves NKB. That's kappa divided by NE squared tau over ME times temperature. Right? And if you now start canceling things out, what do you get? We cancel out 
Me and Me, we cancel out temperature, temperature, we cancel out tau, tau, we cancel out N. And what do we leave with? What are we left with is KB from here squared from here and here times three half from here divided by V squared. And indeed, we obtained that this fraction, this ratio of the heat conductivity, electric conductivity and temperature is expressed only using fundamental physical quantities, the Boltzmann constant, the charge of an electron and a number. And therefore, within the Druder model becomes constant. All right, this is a very good, very good result. Very good result. Qualitative result. What about quantitative result? That means what is the value of this ratio experimentally and when we plug in the actual values for K, B, and E. When we do that, we end up that within the Druda model, the value of this ratio is roughly uh, one times 10 to the minus eight watt ohm per cubic uh, per square Kelvin. Whereas experimentally, the value is about twice as large. It's about 2.20, 2.30. It is very weakly temperature dependent, but the differences between zero degree C and 100 degree C are very weak. So this approximate dependence, uh, this approximate sign here that it's approximately constant is fairly valid. It is astonishing, right? We do not assume or we do not describe explicitly the atoms. The atoms are there only as a statistical scattering centers for the motion of electrons. Electrons are described as ideal gas particles. And still we are able to derive wiedemann franz law in the sense that the, this, fraction, the, this ratio should be constant. And on top of that, we get even a value which is to the order of magnitude correct. This is a huge success of the Truder model. I have to tell you here that this is also a very lucky error canceling that was contributing to this huge success. This error canceling comes from the fact that with this uh, ideal gas approximation, we are approximately 100 times overestimating the mean velocity of electrons. And at the same time, we are underestimating the heat capacity by, by the same factor, by also roughly 100. And this error canceling, at least in the order of magnitude, leads to the fact that the Druder model, despite being and we now know fundamentally wrong because it neglects too much of what is happening. Apart from the atoms, it also neglects the quantum mechanical nature of electrons. It neglects all of these effects such as Paul, Pauli exclusion principle and so on. It leads to the lucky error canceling that then suggests that it has very good predictive power. What I would like to make here a statement at the very end of today's lecture with, uh, with this uh, Edemann Franz law is uh, we provided here for the first time a microscopic description of materials behavior, of material working. This is fascinating. At the same time, we are now, from our perspective, 120 years later, we are critically saying that the assumptions in the Druda model are too coarse. 
Nevertheless, they provide us with belief, with a guidance. How can we try to build our understanding of materials, of material behavior, of material properties, based on the very nanoscale processes or even sub nanoscale processes using fundamental particles and using very few interactions between those fundamental particles that combine in very many different ways and lead to the whole variety of material properties and material uh, behavior. So this, again, a little bit philosophical uh, note at the end of today's lecture brings us to the terms and concept checklist, which I will leave up to you to uh, have a look at it before the exam. It should provide you with a hope that if maybe we improve the description of the electrons, we improve the whole description of the material. And this is indeed the way forward how we describe materials and their 